Hopefully, in just a moment, we will have time to go through all five texts. That's my hope, is that we're actually going to get through all five of these texts. Now, don't look into the text just yet. I'm going to give you the, the overview. These texts are arranged in the order in which they appear in our canon, in our Jewish sacred texts as they've been canonized, but they also have a different progression to them because we're going to talk about an encounter with a sanctified space that takes place without any human input. And then we're going without any human input. And then we're going to talk about the construction of sacred spaces. And then we're going to talk about the exchange of God and hum and humanity in all of those sacred spaces. And finally, hopefully we get to this last and fifth, fifth and last text, that there is purpose to those sacred spaces, particularly the ones that are constructed. So we start in the Torah, not in the Parsha. That's why I gave a little Parsha bite, but we start instead back in Shemot. So I encourage you to open up to source number one, just as in the last class, if you joined for that or, or heard after the fact, we talked about the sanctification of time in the course of the original template, which was Shabbat. That's the sanctification of time. This class begins with the original biblical template for sanctifying space, which is Mount Sinai. That's the original template given to us by the Torah. So I'm going to encourage you to consider, based on your own interpretation, what this chapter in Shemot in Exodus teaches about the meaning of sacred space. And this particular passage that we're looking at is a discussion of a conversation that took place between Moshe and God, Moshe being the one who had the closest relationship per the narrative voice of the Tanakh with God of all of the named uh, prophets that we get in our tradition. So let's get to the text. Text number one. It's on page 37, because this is from a large packet, if you're looking for the number on it. It's class three, the sanctification of space, source one. So Shemot, chapter 19, verses 20 to 23. So, Vai yered Adonai al Hahar Sinai. God came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called to Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. I love this section, because it's a lot of going down and going up, a lot of directionality, which is a parallel, by the way, I encourage you to look into parallelisms with this and the ladder, and uh, Jacob's dream of the ladder, there's beautiful parallels. Okay. You're okay? Yeah? Okay, good, just want to get his okay. Yeah. Okay, great, so, uh, God says something to Moses once, Mo so God comes down to the mountain, Moses goes up to the mountain, and God says to Moses, go down and warn the people not to break through to the Lord to gaze, because lest they might perish. The priests also, Vigama Kohanim, here's our first instruction to the priests not to get too close. So the priests also who come near to God, they have to stay pure lest the Lord break out against them. He fruits by him. But Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us saying, set bounds about the mountain and sanctify it. Kiata haedota banu, you, you caused us to be aware of this situation of boundaries. Lemor saying, Hagbel etahar. Make a, what does that sound like? Hagbel? Gvul. Good. Excellent. So you heard, heard it ringing out, that, that idea of a gvul. And, and this idea of hasagat gvul is the idea of of uh, crossing over a boundary. So Moshe is now quoting God back to God. 
says, wait a minute, you said we weren't supposed to get too close. You also instructed us to sanctify it in the same breath. <clears throat> okay, so this is the conversation that they have. So the Torah is describing God as coming down to Mount Sinai, and already we have a sense, as I mentioned in that Bamidbar text, that there might be some danger that lurks in a space that has God in it. God doesn't want the people to break through to see God, doesn't want the priest to do the same thing, worried about the priests remaining pure. And Moshe goes on and quotes God and further describes the mountain as holy and says it shouldn't be visited. So what's the significance of divine revelation that's taking place in a specially designated place? Why is it important? that this revelation take place in a specially designated place? Is it important? Does the text tell us? I think this is a meta question, right? The text doesn't say, and Har Sinai is a very special place. It's a meta question. Deborah, did you have a thought? Right. And then, and then, what does that mean? I mean, if God came down on the top of the mountain, you would think someone other than Moshe would have noticed that, or if they sort of wrote there. Sure. So Deborah's pointing out that part of the of the dialogue that's going on here seems to reveal, speaking of revelation, that God, God's self, may be torn about how close. God is ready to have the people or the priests to God. God isn't sure, it seems, because Moshe has to say, wait, didn't you say we weren't supposed to get too close? And so there's a little bit of a tug of war going on, perhaps internally, to the divine presence. What do you think, just looking at that very end there, uh, where Moshe is, is quoting this idea, Veki dashto and sanctify it. What do you think holiness means here? How does this meaning of holiness relate to other meanings of kedusha, of sanctity that we've seen elsewhere? What is sanctity as it's defined here? Veki dashto. Yeah. So, Bob, you're right. It does seem like there's an imbued sanctity to this moment from our vantage point as readers. Like, I don't know where the sanctity is coming from, but I see this moment between Moshe, God, and we know what's coming, revelation to the Jewish people, and I think that's a holy moment. I'm not sure what else is holy, but that is. But here in the text, and just to challenge that idea, it seems like the people have a role in that sanctity because as Moshe reminds God, there's a command from God that we should stay back and sanctify the place. Do you have a thought? Okay, so as Jason is pointing out, the, the concept here seems to be that the absence of impure humanity makes for the sanctity of the space. It seems like that distance may even be causal in this sentence, right? Uh, keep, your, keep yourselves beyond a gavul, be back behind some sort of a boundary, and perhaps therefore, in parentheses, it will be a sacred space. You will sanctify it by staying back from it. Do you know what this makes me think of? My dad is a lover of amateur architecture, and uh, it raised me to love the, the history of American architecture, particularly 
craftsman homes because we lived in San Diego. He took me all over Los Angeles. I, I love it. And part of appreciating the history of architecture is understanding the evolution of different rooms in the home. And one of the things that goes through a bit of a sine wave throughout time is this idea that in our home, there ought to be a living room or a sitting room that we shouldn't enter. Who here grew up with parents or a grandparent who had a room you weren't supposed to go into? I had that in my own house. We got a lot of here's uh, in the room here. And I imagine some of you who are watching virtually as well. Hey, that's what this makes me think of. Like, okay, there's gonna be a living room. There's a statue in there you're definitely gonna break. Don't know why we let the grandkids over with it, right? And, and there seems to be this idea I'm not sure if it exactly translates, but I like the concept that perhaps the idea of the space remaining sacred because we don't go into it, I, that I can get. When I think about those very special rooms that we only went in on very special occasions, right? That people don't go into it. Now, the uh, Gen, Gen Xers and millennials rather famously rebelled against this, even some boomers, because it really came from the greatest generation. That was the last sine wave where we had living rooms. This is not a lecture on architecture, but we rebel against the idea, right? We rebel against the concept that there's a space we're not supposed to go into, because wouldn't you think that what makes a space great are the people in it? And that is a tug of war that we have when we have spaces that we love and, and places that we love. I want us to go right on to the next text, which is on page 38 in the packet, source number two. And like I gave you a little bit of a primer on, uh, this is now going to move us to talking about sacred spaces that humanity did have a hand in making. Right? We didn't make Har Sinai. Har Sinai got designated by dint of the fact that a miracle happened there. Uh, but here we have a different text, right? Yes, Marshall. Just one question about the words that they hear in verse. Sure. Yes. Right, so Marshall is contending that that the text, when it's using kof dalid shin in these latter verses here, that we're talking about sanctity through the word separation. Shouldn't it even be translated as kept separate? Now, there are a couple of answers I can give to you. One is many people absolutely translate likhadesh as a, a conception of of sanctifying by means of setting aside. And I gave a whole josh on that a couple of weeks ago, actually. So I guess I'm among them. But secondarily, I'll say, those who would challenge that notion and would translate this as its own thing would say, mm, we have a separate verb, in fact, several, that talk about separating out. Lehavdil and some others as well that are more complex in the Torah itself. And so the question is, what is this, if, if not, Hevdel, if not a differentiation, what is this? It must be, dif I would argue, some sort of thing that means differentiation plus elevation. There's something to Likadesh that's a separating out. And the best word that we have in the English language, really from Latin, is sanctification. But you're right that sanctification itself might be defined as a separating out for the purpose of ritual elevation. That would be my way of talking about it and translating it. I, it's a yes and to, to that question. And a lot of people wrestle with that concept of sanctity really just being a setting apart for sacred purpose, for a special purpose. Yeah, Fran. Sure. So there's this idea that there are in museum spaces, 
works that are so delicate or perhaps so precious would be would be the way of of um maybe that's another nice translation of it like precious in a religious sense that we actually designate out by velvet rope or or some other designation uh that we cannot get close to that thing here what makes sanctification of a space so complicated and this is the perfect uh transition into our having created a sacred space as human beings is that there may or may not be an obvious practical implication. If I can't get close to the Mona Lisa, I might think they're worried I'm going to steal it. They're worried I'm going to touch it. They're worried I'm going to take photography and like the flash will go off and that sort of a thing is an issue. But here, there might be no sense to it. In fact, it might seem contradictory to God's desire to bring us close to go back to Deborah's idea, right? Like, wouldn't you want to? If I wanted to carry this further into the metaphor that you've created, it would be like as if the the artist or the curators in many in many um, cases would say, I really want people to be able to see the texture up close and the colors and the wonderful things and appreciate it, but also please don't get close. Right. So there there is a back and a forth there. I think it's a great image, though, as well, Fran, even if if we don't have that image from an individual home, it's this this precious thing that we're trying to stay away from it and that the notion of preciousness or sanctity is something that we derive, like Bob was saying, from seeing it set aside. Oh, Moshe said we're not supposed to go close to this mountain. This mountain must be special, right? Or, oh gosh, that painting seems to have many alarms and, and guards around it. It must be special. So it teaches us as well. Source number two takes us about six chapters later into Shemot, where we quickly move into the concept that we need to have a dwelling place for God when we're not sitting there at Har Sinai or standing there at a distance from Har Sinai. God spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel so that they take from me an offering from every person whose heart is willing, shall you take my offering. I actually wrote a song about this verse for my interview weekend here at Temple Beth Am. So that was like nine years ago that I wrote a song. Um, I have a, it's a great, it's a great uh, verse because it speaks to uh, so many different aspects of sanctity and also that the directions once again are not coming directly from God, but from Moshe to Bnei Yisrael. They should take an offering from every person whose heart is willing and then this is the offering that you should take from them. And then they list all the different types of metals and materials that should be listed. And we're going to skip down to verse Zion, verse 7. Uh, onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and the breastplate. So we're already we're learning what are some of these things going to be used for. And then, v'asuli mikdash v'shachanti betocham. And and let them, they shall make for me a mikdash. Now we have it in a nounal form. Vishachanti betocham. And I will dwell among them. It's a few questions, but very short questions. We can get to all our texts. Why would people build a building for a God who is not corporeal? Because perhaps in that place, you can still feel God, even if it's not physical. Perhaps there's a metaphysicality to it that we bring. We seem to be instructed that if you build it, they will come, right? God will come, um, to quote a great movie. So, ve might be consequential here, and might be consequential. And I will dwell among them if they should make for me a place that is mikdash. But why? Joey, do you have an idea? So God's presence can be felt anywhere, says Joey. So it can't be just for God's presence. What else could it be for? Right? What else could it be for, man? The neighbors. The neighbors. Ah, so like Keruv. Like it's it's the Chabad tent, right? 
And it's and it's uh, Orla Goyim. We're we're light to the nations. Great. If you want to have more followers, you probably want to have a building. And I'm going to de derive from from that concept that um, that part of what you're saying, and a little bit of what Rachel's saying, is this concept of the sanctuary place being for our sake. I'm open to push back on that concept, but so far as I can see it, so far we are making a meek dash for the sake of God dwelling. But that does seem ultimately to be for the sake of humanity. Tom and then Jason, and then I'll move around. <laughs> so Great. So Tom is saying any individual perhaps can experience God wherever they go or maybe in particular places, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in a mikdash made by people. But if you want people to be doing this God sacred work together, if you want to experience God cohortatively, if you want to experience it in a group, you got to experience it in a place that's set aside for that. So we're setting aside a place so that we can do it in a group. Fascinating, and I, I like that concept. Yeah. Okay, so Jason is helping us understand, thinking about, first of all, the chapters in the text and how they proceed, and also thinking about the way that our human minds can conceive of God and God worship, that this was the next natural step in the course of the narrative of the Jewish people. Am I getting that idea right? We were at Har Sinai, we had the mountain, and then, you know, perhaps a few people raised their hand and said, so at some point are we leaving this place? And if we do, is God coming with us? Because that's a real raw question. You have burning insights or questions you want to add, or can we move on to the next text? What do you think? Can we, can we go to the next text? Great. So let's go to source number three. First book of Kings. We're going to keep digging into this notion of the human uh, container for God. Now we've moved into the Nah, part of Tanakh. But will God truly dwell on earth? Great question to start with. But will God truly dwell on earth? Behold, the heavens, the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Yet attend to the prayer and supplication of your servant, O Lord my God, to hearken to the cry and prayer which your servant prays before you this day that your eyes may be open toward this house day and night towards the place of which you said, my name shall be there, Shemi Sham, to hearken to the prayer which your servant shall pray towards this place. And hear the supplication of your servant and your people Israel when they shall pray towards this place, El Mekom, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. If a person sins against one's neighbor and obliges their neighbor in an oath, causing them to swear, and that person comes and swears before your altar in this house, we're going to do one more verse, here in heaven and do and judge your servants condemning the wicked to bring their way upon their own head and justifying the righteous, given them according to their righteousness. So would you say that this seems to fit into Jason's notion of a progression of going from a mountain to a, what was the Mishkan? It's like a, yeah, full, a pack and fold, you know, a pack, the pack and play, the pop-up. Very good. I like that. The, the, the pop-up uh, tent version to a dwelling place. And it's going to be this place. And you're going to come to this place and you're going to go to this place. And it's going to be a central location where people are going to come to pray. We're going to hop quickly to the Tosefta 
I would love to dwell on the ha, dwell on the king on the king's piece, but um, I just I like like the dad jokes of of, of Jewish. It's the epitome of Jewish nerddom. Um, we're going to go to page forty two and get through this Hosefta. It might be the last text we get to. We'll see if we get a little further. To this point, we stress the significance of holy space for connecting God and human beings to one another. But in the next two sources, at least this one that we'll get to, we've got to talk about the social dimensions of what holy space can accomplish. So these, both of these sources are post-biblical and they were penned by ancient rabbis. They lived in a different religious milieu than we do, but they maintained their imagination, even as they're talking about this, about the importance of the site of the temple. Right? They hadn't lost sight of the site <laughs> of the temple, but here they were trying to imagine the social benefits of having such a place. Okay. This is the Tosefta. It depends on who you ask, but either parallel or earlier um, uh, uh, text to, uh, let's see, it's about 200 CE probably or so, just to give you some historical context. Those are, uh, that are standing outside of the land of Israel should direct their hearts towards the land of Israel and only then pray, as it is said, and those that pray to you by the way of their land, etc. Those that are standing in the land of Israel should direct their hearts towards Jerusalem and only then pray, as it's said, and they'll pray to God by way of the city that you've chosen. Those that are standing in Jerusalem should direct their hearts towards the temple, as it's said, and they should pray towards their house. And those that are standing in the temple should direct their hearts to the Kodesh Kodeshim, to the Holy of Holies, and only then pray. And then they give another proof text from that same place in Kings. It comes out that all of those standing in the north will be facing the south. All of those standing in the south will be facing the north. All of those standing in the east will be facing west. And all of those standing in the west will be facing the east and it will come out that all of the Jewish people will be praying towards one place. Yeah, Joel. I have a question about directing their hearts. Yes. Standing in the Kotel, you direct your hearts. Yes. Does that mean I should physically face east or does that mean a kavana and my direction of my mind should be in Israel no matter which way I have to physically face east? Great question. So Joel says, uh, does that mean that I have to physically move myself? Or does kiven at libo mean like direct your heart as in my intentionality is directed towards is it physical or not? I'm not going to give you a, a perfect answer. I'm just going to give you a funny answer because you're Joel. So my grandfather, Alava Shalom, lived till almost 103 years old. And when I asked him, you know, when we were discussing this idea of the Maizmanim app, you know, this idea that we're so precise about the times that we have at, nowadays. He used to say, like, what do you think we did back in 1928, you know, when I was a kid? What do you think we did when it came to knowing the exact time? Which I'll translate to, what do you think we did when we didn't have a compass exactly with us at the time? What, what do we do? I, I um, you know, it, do your best, given at Libo. And I think it contains both those possibilities, both that we maybe ought to, uh, and there is more discussion in the Talmud on that, but here I'm answering just if the Tosefta were to stand alone, um, that yeah, maybe it means direct your body, but if you didn't know, at the very least, the text specifically says, Kiven at Libo. Rather than uh, raise more discussion, since I want us to get to the last, uh, last source, I want to share with you an insight that I, I love from whoever prepared this beautiful packet, which is, I think we all understand this idea that there is unity, kind of like Tom described the unity of being in one tent. There's a great deal of unity in the idea globally that we could all be facing one another in the same direction. I like this idea though, that we transcend the concept of simply all of us directing ourselves towards the same place and that we're actually directing ourselves towards each other. I'd never quite thought of it in that way before, but what an extraordinary thing that Jews all over the world, by means of trying to direct themselves to an umbilical place on the planet, are directing themselves towards each other as well. It would be a really nice concept to end on, but I want to look at the very last source and then we'll, um, we'll say Birkat Amazon. So it was taught by Rabbi Yehuda, whosoever 
did not see the double colonnade of Alexandria and Egypt, did not see the glory of Israel. And then he goes on to describe just how gorgeous it was. I'm going to hop to the middle of it. And there was a wabima in the middle and the canter of the gathering <laughs> would stand upon it with kerchiefs in his hands that they could follow him. And when it reached the time to answer amen, he would wave his kerchief and the whole nation would answer amen. And they would not sit mixed, but goldsmiths by themselves and silversmiths by themselves and glass blowers by themselves. And when a pauper would enter, he would recognize his fellow skilled men and head there. And from there, his sustenance and that of his household would come. So I, I want us to end on this notion that builds on the concept of Jews all looking at one another, which is that since the concept of a sacred space has been around, the Jewish people have believed that part of the sanctity of that space is the way that people use that space to practically help their neighbors by giving them a lift. There are other texts that speak to other ways in which temple spaces and Mishkan spaces also became places to acknowledge, for example, those who were grieving. Some of you might know that particular source, that there was an entrance for those who were in mourning, and in that way, uh, there were people who could be acknowledged by one another. This text, to me, adds to that notion that the synagogue has never just been a place to ignore the human beings in there and around there, and just to go inside and just kivenetli bo al Hashem, to just direct yourself towards God. It has always been a place where we come together to take care of each other. And I think that that's a part of the designation of the sanctity of that space.